Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. <laughs> Cruising your way on this episode of Off 90. We visit a school for dancing in Winona. Also in Winona, we attend an exhibit of finely detailed model ships. We check in on the city of Mankato. And we observe textile art in Owatonna. It's all just ahead, Off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. Dancing is an ancient art form that involves delicate physical movements. The main focus of the Winona Conservatory of the Arts is dance education. Students range in age from preschool to high school, and the lessons include tap and ballet. Students at the conservatory learn confidence, teamwork, and physical grace. in the arts, it's the life skills that students get from it, no matter what age they are. My name is Jamie Schwaba. I'm the Managing Director of the Minnesota Conservatory for the Arts. We are a full arts conservatory, so we have dance classes, we have theater, music, and art as well. We're right kind of in the center of Winona and um, we're on what used to be the former St. Teresa's campus. We started as a ballet school um, about 40 years ago, and it was founded by Stephanie Valencia Carolyn, and she had a vision to start as a ballet school, but also wanted to eventually include all of the arts. She ended up in Winona by her husband, um, who was one of the founders of Fastenal. Um, which is a huge local industry for us here in Winona. She had a, a huge amount of professional dance experience um, and teaching experience and wanted to bring that to um, Winona. A conservatory for the arts um, means that we're a little bit more all-encompassing, a training ground usually conservatories mean it's a little bit more serious. We have students that age and range from three through adults. We have our youngest dancers, which are in the creative movement, and we have a lot of students kind of that range the board, but we also then have the college students as well. We have a very strong pre-professional dance program um, that we have a summer dance intensive that we invite people from all over. We have students that come from Alaska and Texas. Um, to attend the two-week intensive. We also have a boys' dance program. Our Irish dance program, though um, it's only, um, only started this year, has really grown. We have some theater camps as well as visual arts workshops. And with our music um, division, we have a jazz combos program. My name is Megan Lynch, and I mostly study ballet here at Minnesota Conservatory for the Arts. Um, I also do study um, some jazz and tap as well. I can't really say exactly what got me interested. I've always watched it when I was younger and thought it was just a really cool thing, and it was something I've always wanted to do, and it's a dream come true. The community is just an amazing part of the conservatory. We're not as competitive as other schools, but you still get the same rich education out of it. Just because it's a smaller group of people, it, it can bring everyone together and you form almost a closer relationship with the teachers, almost as a parent. So you trust them a lot and you can be close and comfortable with them. 
My parents are always very encouraging and always want what's best for me and it encourages me to do the things I love. My name is Ann Lynch and my daughter is Megan Lynch. I think we saw a Nutcracker performance and we looked into her dancing here but she was too young. But meanwhile we would just put on uh, classical music at home and she would put on her tutu and she'd dance around the living room. She said, that's okay mom, I'll practice at home. So she practiced and so she always knew she wanted to dance. Because she even at two and a half and three would just feel the music and run around how she heard the music. She has enjoyed expressing herself through dance. Her confidence and her poise has really skyrocketed through dance, being up on stage in front of people. My son does karate here as well, so I live in this building. Right now we're standing in the Gallery Valencia and we have on showcase artwork that is from Winona Area Catholic Schools. Um, each month we try to um, highlight a different area school. We have our Black Box Studio Theater, which is a wonderful space. It can seat about 150 people. We also have practice rooms and we also have a recital hall that's utilized mostly by our jazz combos. Most all of our instructors um, do have degrees in their area that they're teaching. So anything that we can do to be a part of the community. I just love being surrounded by the arts and I love what we do here. Um, being able to offer s these families in the community such quality arts education. It is wonderful to watch her dance. There's nothing more that I love doing is to watch her dance. Because she's in her element when she's dancing. So it's heartwarming. The Minnesota Marine Art Museum is located on the shores of the Mississippi River in Winona. The culture that surrounds lakes, rivers, and oceans is what the museum displays. We went to the Minnesota Marine Art Museum to check out an exhibit of model ships. These models are highly detailed, and some of them were made nearly two centuries ago. It's the kind of thing that I think has the possibilities to engage someone who's really into maritime history, but also I think that there's an artistic fascination with the very graceful form of ships. There's certainly several angles that you can look at an exhibition like this. And um, it's really the first time that we've exhibited all of these tremendous ship models in one show. We've expanded actually twice in the last two years. We've, uh, 2000 and um, 13, we added the Stephen and Barbara Sloggy Family Gallery, an amazing European collection that uh, resides in that gallery. And then our largest gallery we added last year, which is the Richard and Jane Manugian Gallery. And that is a vast 5,000 square foot space meant to exhibit the museum's Hudson River School collection, which can best be described as basically 19th century um, romantic American landscape painting. Really. Uh, probably one of the best of its kind that a person can find. The museum is not a maritime museum, uh, necessarily. We, uh, we're definitely an art museum, but one of the collections we do have, and one of our strengths, is in marine painting and maritime artifacts. And we happen to have a tremendous collection of handcrafted ship models some of them historic, some of them from the 20th century, and we think of it as the core of the apple, so to speak, and we're, we're certainly uh, interested in sort of expanding what people think of when they think of a marine art museum. All of the models on display in this exhibition are from the museum's collection. Uh, it's stuff that we've had either donated to us or that we've acquired through acquisitions. Each of the models in this exhibition are either historic 
or have been hand built by craftsmen uh, from each from individual parts. Nothing in here was commercially bought. These aren't a plastic model that you would buy at the store. Hundreds and hundreds of hours of fine tuning and building and creating small parts go into each one of these. Um, all of them take a lot of historic research, looking at blueprints, ship's plans, and having a thorough understanding of what every single individual component does. What every line does, what every block, every tackle, every component that you see all works in concert to create a complex ship. Well, there's a variety of reasons for building ship models. Uh, one is they are part of the actual building process. Long before computers, long before CAD design, you had to work out your ideas in advance in 3D before you could lift a tool to create a ship. Problems in naval architecture could be solved in advance to see how well the ship will sail, how fast it'll be, how much cargo it will hold, how stable it'll be under certain conditions. By building models, you can test and work out ideas in, on small scale before you commit to time and money to do it on a large scale. Others, uh, people look at these as uh, historic objects and they're just interested in that period of history. And for some, they're just an object of beauty. They, they, they create them just like you would a sculpture or a work of art. The models in this exhibition uh, range from the early 19th century. We have some Napoleonic era models uh, running all the way up to the current day. The Napoleonic prisoner of war models were made by uh, people in the French Navy who were captured by the British. Uh, they spent upwards of eight years in prison in England and to pass the time they created these models. Uh, the largest model in the exhibition is of USS Constitution, the American Revolutionary Warship. Uh, it is an historic model built in the late 1920s and it is comprised completely of white oak from the original ship itself and some of the metallic fixtures in it came from the original ship from the U.S. Navy. Uh, in particular, the copper that are used to make some of these tiny fixtures were originally supplied to George Washington and the U.S. Navy from Paul Revere. With this exhibition, even if you don't have an interest or know nothing about ship models or ships themselves, I think you'll learn something if you come in and take a look you'll probably come away with a better understanding of what you're seeing on the walls in the collection, and then a better understanding of our history and a better understanding of ships themselves. Paintings of ships, model ships, have this heartfelt appreciation for the sea, and I think that comes through when you look at them. I think that's sort of the vein that runs through what we can, art historically, what we can really characterize as marine art. And then I think what's really interesting about the museum is you have this very precise tradition, which this very comfortably fits into. And then you have all these opportunities to push the boundaries of what that can mean. Um, with, whether it's modern art, whether it's um, impressionism, romanticism, contemporary artists, whose work is uh, inspired by the river environment. I think all of that lends to this, this organization. Another river city located where the Minnesota River meets the Blue Earth River is Mankato. We went to Mankato to learn a little more about this city. It's past, present and future. What we found was a thriving city steeped in Minnesota history. Mankato is located at the bend of the Minnesota River, um, so that is a natural geographic feature of this county. And um, Blue Earth County was settled originally in 1853. The early settlers to Mankato were in the early 1850s. They used steamboat traffic on the Minnesota River to get to this area. I'm Jessica Potter, the director of the Blue Earth County Historical Society. 
prior to white settlement coming to Blue Earth County and to Mankato, the group that was here was primarily the Dakota, the Sioux, um, were, were settled in this area and they were the ones, up, up until the point of the westward expansion, uh, that was the primary inhabitants of, of Blue Earth County and this area. So in 1853, Blue Earth County becomes an official county of the state of Minnesota and Mankato becomes the county seat. So this area, right off the bat, 1850, early 1850s, started to see um, a good influx of people coming here, building homes, using the natural resources of the stone quarries um, to build houses and to build buildings. And they started living here and building their businesses here. And then of course railroad tr um, transportation comes into play and that is a huge boom um, for this community and that was also the demise of the steamboat traffic um, because the railroad could get a lot more places a lot faster. So as the community kept growing, um, the industry was the biggest thing that kept the, kept the community itself moving forward. So by the 1870s, um, an industry that is close to this organization was um, Hubbard, um, R.D. Hubbard's flour mill industry. He opened Hubbard Milling Company in the 1870s. He built that flour mill industry um, on Front Street, which is now Riverfront Drive. He built that in the late 1870s, and he was one of many captains of industry who were settling here. And then of course, um, Mankato and Blue Earth County is known for what happened during 1862, which was the U.S.-Dakota War of 1862. The conflict itself was in western Minnesota, down the Minnesota River. Mankato is where everything, all the trials and everything that resulted in the conflict happened here, but there was actually no battles or no um, conflict itself that occurred on Blue Earth County soil. But Mankato is known because this location was the largest mass execution in U.S. history. Um, on December 26, 1862, 38 Native Americans, 38 Dakota. Warriors were hanged in downtown Mankato. Agriculture plays a huge role um, in the development of Blue Earth County and Mankato itself. And that is seen by the rich agricultural lands that make up Blue Earth County. So you have a lot of, a lot of that farmland around here that's feeding into those industries. But you also then had the mill, you had a, we had a textile mill. Um, we had lots, and besides the processing of what is being um, produced, in the fields, you also had to have the machinery and the, um, the blacksmiths and the different, those industries to support them as well. I think there's always been a steady growth for Mankato, which is why it has become what it has today. Uh, people who move to the frontier uh, were always cognizant that if a community is going to grow, part of the reason it's going to grow is if it can acquire public institutions. Uh, I'm William E. Lass. I'm Professor Emeritus of History, Minnesota State University, Mankato. So the people that you might regard as Mankato's schemers hit on the idea that if you could acquire a normal school, this is an institution that had the prospect of growth. Uh, the normal school, of course, was not a college. Uh, it was an institution designed for training teachers for rural schools. The entire normal school phase was in the valley. Uh, as was the teacher's college phase. And after World War II, and particularly after the advent of the GI Bill, uh, <clears throat> there was a need to expand the campus physically. And so the suggestion was made of going up the hill. 
Now, as far as the things that caused the university to expand rapidly, uh, one, of course, would be the immediate post-World War II period. Uh, GI Bill is part of the story. A second part of the story is a general enrichment of people in Minnesota and the nation and changing expectation about education goals. Now, interestingly enough, the enrollment has resurged, so to speak. And part of the reason for that is an expansion of what you might think of as uh, uh, more practical training. Uh, a big expansion of the nursing program, for example. The interesting thing is about the normal school that it's been in place for almost 150 years um, in different forms, different names, but it's always been here. So you started 150 years ago with one little teacher's college that used a, the upper floor of a commercial building to now having four higher education institutions just in this, this community alone. I love living in this community because I love the growth of this community. I love to um, just watch the things that are happening, but also have an understanding of where we've come. And to be able to look back and say, wow, this is the place where Maud Hart Lovelace wrote her books about Betsy and Tacy, and those are real people. And to be able to constantly um, look back at our past and understand it and explore it and discover it and learn new things every day, but to also be looking ahead and just imagining that these are all moments in time that are going to get recorded in that, that long history of Mankato and Blue Earth County. Carolyn Halliday and Kimber Olson are textile artists. The muse for their visual medium is fabric rather than paint or pencil. We went to the Owatonna Art Center to check out a show by these artists. Both artists reference the cycles in nature while exploring both traditional and non-traditional materials, redefining what a textile is. The world of textiles is really a fascinating world because they're breaking all the rules. In the materials they're using, their interpretation with them, how they're dyeing them, how they're altering them. So this is a very exciting exhibition. Surrounding me, I have a textile exhibition, and what is really exciting about this exhibition is the unusual materials that the artists have used. Well, if you kind of look at the two artists here, one pretty much takes the wire in, crochets it and weaves it, and it becomes very dimensional, very sculptural. And along with that, she's added other things. She's also used a couple of bird's nests that she's added paper to and fabric with, and created a very personal statement. The other artist we may think of as maybe slightly more traditional using um, some fabric that I think may be organza, which is uh, very transparent that she's altered by dyeing in various different ways, and then how she's assembled it in this textural way that has been sewn as well. So there's maybe a little more traditional handling of the material, but still very expressive and very personal. Textile artists, I think, have a lot more fun probably than the traditional artists, and it's a an field and an area that I think excites both men and women because there's an opportunity to use a variety of material. They're not confined by the constraints of history and material, and they're finding new ways to express themselves. 
What I like about the exhibition is the variety of work, and I, I especially enjoy coming in here and being surrounded by it, because what's really neat about this exhibition and pretty much whenever you visit the museum or a gallery is all of the wonderful feelings and creativity that surrounds you, uh, whether it's a painting or a textiles, um, sculpture or print making. Um, it's that wonderful creativity and energy that the artists have put into each piece that really makes it um, a wonderful and a very special and unique um, experience. That's all for this episode. Please help Off 90 meet its financial obligations by becoming a member of KSMQ Public Television. Give us a call at 507-481-2095 or 1-800-658-2539 or sign up online at ksmq.org. Thanks for watching. Join us next time, Off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.